Hello, and welcome to the Odessa First Assembly Podcast. My name is Tony, and I'm the Digital Ministry Manager here at OFA. Today, we're kicking off a new sermon series titled, The Lordship of Jesus. Throughout this series, we'll be exploring what it truly means to submit to Jesus and make Him the Lord of our lives. Pastor Todd Starnes will be sharing powerful insights into this important topic. So without further ado, let's jump right into today's message from The Lordship of Jesus. If you have your Bibles, if you have your Bibles, Anybody bring their actual tree Bible, their paper Bible? Who's, raise it up if you brought your Bible. Yeah. Awesome. I forgot to uh, charge um, my iPad, so y'all get to preaching for my computer. Today I have 23 pages of notes, so I hope you're ready. <laughs> We're starting a new series this morning called The Lordship of Jesus, and um, this last week, actually, I, I was kind of had some ideas and um, kind of shifted around, and we were in staff meeting this week, and just asked, hey, do y'all have any ideas? And um, actually, Taylor mentioned that they were doing the, over the Lordship of Jesus and Youth on Wednesday nights, and I thought, you know, um, I, I've referred a lot to it through the years, but never over the last 10 years have I really preached a, a sermon series, and so we're going to talk about the Lordship of Jesus over the next few weeks. And I really think that as Americans... I, we have a, I think, a more difficult time grasping what the Lordship of Jesus means. And so we're going to be talking about some of that. But let's pray before we get started. Father, we thank you, Lord, for your presence and your work today. And, Lord, we, we just thank you once again for um, those that are going to celebrate being raised up to new life in just a few moments. And I pray, Lord, that you would just continue that work in our hearts, that you would speak to us our our hearts will be good soil, ready to receive your word. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. Um, I do want to encourage you really quick. You heard about the, the, um, the, the church app and the church center app. I want to encourage you to get that. So we've made more updates. So now you'll start seeing things on the calendar and events. Um, Mike and Charmin's connect group is going to be a little bit of a guinea pig. So we got their group listed on that church center app. And, and for their, their small group, but hopefully this week we'll kind of get all of those listed and working. So just a great way to connect and see what's going on. You can give through the app. You can see what's coming up on the app. You can connect with people. It's pretty cool. So you just go to your, your, the Play Store or the App Store, download the Church Center app, and then you'll look for our church. And just really want to encourage you to grab a hold of that. But let's get started. Matthew, we're going to look at three different passages and uh, one of them is Matthew chapter 28 and verse 18. One is Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 22. The other one is Colossians chapter 1 and verse 16. So that's Matthew chapter 28, Ephesians chapter 1, Colossians chapter 1. And I know sometimes maybe if you have your paper Bible, you sometimes have a hard time finding. I The way I look at all the shuns books, that's... Um, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, that's Gentiles eat pork chops. That's a good way to remember that. And so we're looking at the eat and the chops. Ephesians chapter 1, Colossians chapter 1. And so let's read those together. Matthew 28, 18. Jesus came and told his disciples, I have been given all. Everybody say all. Authority in heaven and on earth. Flip over to Ephesians chapter 1, verse 22. God has put all things, everybody say all, all, under the authority of Christ and has made him head over, and let's say it again, everybody together, all things for the benefit of the church. Now, where I come from, I don't know where you come from, but all means, it means everything, doesn't it? It means all. Colossians chapter 1, verse 16, for through him God created everything in the heavenly realms and on earth. He, has, he made the things we can see and the things we can't see, such as thrones and kingdoms and rulers and authorities in the unseen world. Everything was created through him and for him. And so this is a kind of a summation of what we just read is that Jesus is the ruler over everything, over all. He rules over it all. His lordship is based on ownership. 
His lordship is based on ownership. There is a preacher that lived some time ago. I'd encourage you to go listen to some of his stuff. Matter of fact, some of the videos we played, we played one last week at Easter. We played uh, uh, the one that um, uh, it's Friday, but Sunday's coming. You remember that video? We played that, and, and there's other different videos we use his voice on, but it's S.M. Lockridge. And talking about the lordship of Jesus, this is something he said. He said he didn't have to put a signature on the corner of a sunrise because he owns it. He didn't have to carve his initials in the side of a mountain. He is the owner. He didn't have to put a brand on the cattle of a thousand hills. He owns them. He didn't have to take out a copyright on the songs that Bird sings because he is the owner. The Lord is the Lord over all. And everything and everybody and everyone that that tries to uh, set themselves up against the kingdom of God, the scripture says that one day every knee shall bow and every tongue confess that he is Lord. I don't know about you, but I would rather him be my Lord now. I'd rather surrender and submit now. Psalm chapter 24 and verse 1 says, The earth is the Lord's and everything in it, the world and all. Everybody say all. Its people belong to him. Everything is under him, belongs to him, was created for him and through him. I mean, if I were to add it, I could add a fourth text in Acts chapter 2 and verse 36. You're not going to have this one, but it says, this is when Peter's preaching. It's on the day of Pentecost. And he said, so let everyone in Israel know for certain that God has made it this Jesus whom you crucified, both Lord and Messiah. He is Lord. When Jesus is the Lord of a person's life, he will fulfill his duties and obligations and responsibilities with joy, meaning me. When God, when Jesus is the Lord of my life, to live out my Christian service, I can do it even if it's a duty, even if it's a, dis- it's a discipline or an obligation. It's something I get to do with joy. As W. Zwemer said this, you'll see it on the screen, unless Jesus is Lord of all, he's not Lord at all. And many of us know that quote and have heard that quote before. But the question this morning is, is Jesus the Lord over everything for you? Is he the Lord of your thoughts? Is he the Lord of your emotions? Is he the Lord of your speech, of your relationships, of your possessions? You see, he, whether we declare him as Lord or see him as Lord, he's Lord. So we we don't make him Lord He's already Lord. I know sometimes when we pray, and, we, and, and, and there's nothing inherently wrong with it, but sometimes we pray like coming to, um, um, uh, to the Lord in faith and to Jesus in, in faith, and, and we pray that prayer, you know, I, Lord, I want to make you the Lord of my life. Well, the reality is whether we serve him or not, he's already Lord. He's already Lord over all. And I I just want, listen, I I don't want you to leave here and feel like like that I I beat up on you or, uh, you know, the old school term. If you've been around church for, you know, I'm not not trying to, you know, be on a soapbox or or preach some, you know, browbeating is what we used to call it back in the day. But listen to me. I think one of the, and you're going to hear this over and over and over this morning. I think one of the reasons that people have a difficult time would change in their life is because Jesus really has not become the Lord of their life. If he's Lord, it brings change. I mean, process it again of your thoughts, of your emotions, of your speech, of your relationships, of your possessions over your whole life. The challenge to us Christians is to bring all areas under his sovereign rule. Everything in our life, there should be no rivalry to his lordship. 
If you remember, one of the commandments is one, you should not, we're, we're not to have any other gods before him. Yet, so many of us live our life that way. We may not have a, a graven image, but we place a lot of things above his lordship. And I think our culture, we don't have an understanding. We, we don't have an understanding. Now, those that, you know, matter of fact, we had, you know, last week, I mean, it was, we had a great Easter Sunday, great Easter day. Sixteen people came to the Lord last Sunday, and we celebrate that. But we also had 16 Spanish speakers on translation devices last week. We almost had every one of them taken. And those that have come from Cuba, they understand a little bit about dictatorships. But us as Americans, we don't. We don't understand dictatorships. We don't understand uh, 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 someone having a sovereign rule, rule over a country. We don't understand emperors and, and things of that nature. Our Constitution and our, our Bill of Rights is that way of life for us. And I, I, do think it's, I do think it's under attack, if I can just get a little bit of a soapbox, but... We, we live in a democracy. We live in, we get to vote. We, we have a say. There was a, a speech by Abraham Lincoln, and, and a lot of how we see the way, how we live was Abraham Lincoln gave in that speech, and he said this. It, 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 as he gave this speech after the battle, he said that these dead shall not have died in vain, that this nation under God shall have a birth of freedom, and that the government of the people, by the people, for the people. And so we have this mentality, and I think it makes it difficult for us to really understand the lordship of Jesus. We should know that the word Christian in our culture is really used quite loosely. There are people who consider themselves Christian because they live in the U.S. Matter of fact, there's a lot of other nations that see, sees our whole population as Christian. And it, they have a hard time reconciling because they see a lot of the junk that comes out of media and entertainment. And it doesn't add up with what a Christian is supposed to be. But it, it's, it's all a matter of perception. Um, there, there's people that think they're okay with the Lord because their parents were Christian. Or maybe they were baptized once, even though they no longer live with Jesus being the Lord of their life. Maybe they, in some, what we used to, I heard preached all the time, and maybe some of you have in this room, is that you can't get to heaven on your grandparents' coattails. But there's a lot of people that have that view that they're okay. I mean, me and the big guy upstairs. I'm going to tell you, if you're coming the big guy upstairs, you don't have a comprehension of lordship. Being American does not make us Christian. Going to church does not make us Christian. Having Christian parents does not make us Christian. Believing that there is a God does not make us Christian. Saying that we love Jesus does not make us Christian. And I've gotten a place in my life that I, it's getting, there's nothing wrong with the word Christian, but the reality is there's a lot of people that claim that status who don't live up to it, where we should be believers and disciples. Born again Christians are those who believe in Christ and follow him. Born again Christians are those who believe in Christ, but follow him. Are you, are you following me this morning? Are we? Born again Christians are those who believe in Christ and follow him. John chapter 3, verses 5 through. I love John chapter 3. I mean, a, you know, that's where we get, obviously, John three sixteen, which most of us are familiar with. But John three sixteen came out of a discussion with a religious man that he came to Jesus during the night and asked him, a question, but we see part of that conversation in verses 5 and 7. I assure you, this is what, how Jesus responds to him. He's asking how to be born again. Jesus replied, I assure you, no one can enter the kingdom of God without being born of water and the Spirit. And that's one of the things we're going to celebrate today is, 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 is that baptism. 
Verse 6, humans can reproduce human life, but the Holy Spirit gives birth to spiritual life. So don't be surprised when I say you must be born again. Listen, if you want, if you, if, if you want to spend eternity in heaven, if you want to have that uh, a title or label as believer, Christian, disciple, whatever the case may be, you have to be born again. And we celebrate, it happened to 16 people last week, but that is just the beginning. That is just the start. Being born again is a radical change brought about by the Holy Spirit. Because it happens by water, and it also happens by spirit. And so when we are truly born again, there is a shift, there is a change that happens in our life. Now listen to me, I know, I mean, when I was growing up, I've talked so many times about this, you know, that, I mean, my little old church where I grew up, you know, I mean, I got, I got saved every week, every week. I mean, we had 52 salvations in one year and they were all me. I mean, I understand living life that way. I get it. But I'll tell you what, I remember the day. I remember the day. It was on a cold night in February of 1994. I mean, the, boy, that just seems like so long ago now. I was a freshman in college trying to live my, my life. But I remember that night because I remember it. I mean, just not the encounter of the tears and the repentance. But I remember getting up from my face being in that pew and walking out of that church that night and everything was just different. I mean, I walked out of that church thinking, man, the air smells different. Everything seems brighter. The load is off my shoulders. I had a spirit encounter with a holy God, and I came out of that with a new birth that changed my life forever. And all those times in my life, I had never had an encounter like that one, and I knew that it was different. Being born again is a radical change brought about by the Holy Spirit. See, the Bible says in John 5, 18... We know that God's children, everybody say God's children. Now I want you, you got to get this verse, okay? This, this, this may could be a good memory verse for us. 1 John 5, 18, we know that God's children do not make practice of sinning. Matter of fact, in, in my Bible, I have that underlined and highlighted. Practice sinning for God's son holds him securely and the evil one cannot touch him. Now listen to me. I am on a mission this year to see the cycle break in people's lives. And I, I really believe that sometimes what happens is, is, is we come from all kinds of backgrounds and, and we, I mean, we deal with, we have, we, we contend with, with, with addictions and cycles and, and, you know, hurt and abuse or, I mean, whatever it is that marks our past, but so many times it's like over, it's, it's just like, it's almost like clockwork. It, it's, it's the parable of the sower. You see people come and make a choice to come in the kingdom, but then that their faith gets challenged and persecuted or the tribulations start happening around them and their their faith really tends to dry up and wither or be stolen by the enemy and it seems like the seed that finds a good soil is is really minimal and i want to say this is that if you're struggling, if that's the repetitive nature you're going through of getting right with God, 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 that pattern can be broken today. And I know, you know, there's some that when they come to faith in Christ, you know, for me, I feel like I I know, I know that I was extremely blessed because I, I live life with the worst of them. I mean, I, I'm so open. I talk about it so, so much and so often. And I look back of, of there's like kind of a core of us that, that got saved. And, 
and realizing that I'm the only one that it kind of stuck, so to speak. And I, I asked so many times, and I wonder, why? What's the difference? And there's reasons why that we fall back. And I, God brought a deliverance in my life that was immediate. And I know that it doesn't happen with everybody that way. I realize that and understand that. And so what I'm trying to say is that if you're in the cycle of addiction, if you're in the cycle of like, if it's, uh, you know, you just really hadn't seen that change in nature. I'm not necessarily saying that Jesus hasn't become the Lord of your life, but I am saying that's a possibility. Because the reality is this, is that, yeah, there's, when whatever the it is that binds, whatever the iniquity is, whatever it is that, chain, that, that has us chained back, we, we continue to struggle with it for, for several reasons. One, it may be that you still like the addiction. That may be one reason. Uh, there was a man one time I heard him, you know, he was, he was talking about just his, his uh, process of, of quitting tobacco. And he said, um, he said, what I realized was is that I love tobacco more than I love Jesus. And sometimes that can be a pattern in our life. Now, sometimes it, we can have the pure heart and, and we make that decision and choice, but we still struggle with that pattern. And I'm going to tell you, sometimes it is a process. Sometimes you need community. Sometimes you need a small group or a connect group. Sometimes you need people surrounding. Sometimes you need teen challenge. Sometimes you need living free. Sometimes you need a counselor, and, and sometimes you need medication. Are you following me? I, I am not one of those that is an admit it, quit it, forget it gospel. <laughs> I know sometimes it's a process. And I'm grateful that his work is still continuing in me. Matter of fact, he says he'll complete it on the day of the Lord Jesus. He's not done with us yet. The view of lordship, the view of the lordship of Jesus determines a level of our surrender to the work of the Holy Spirit in us. The view of the lordship of Jesus determines a level of our surrender to the work of the Holy Spirit in us. Now, I want to tell you something. I, you know... Uh, maybe you caught my, my post on Facebook this week, maybe you didn't, but it kind of, I, I did some research, and it was really quite amazing. So I went like on, on YouTube and, and different podcasts and, you know, areas where, you know, I just like to listen to guys and, and preach, and it was pretty astounding to me because like if they were, if the sermon title was like, you know, um, you know, you're going to, you know, be blessed beyond measure, how, how to be blessed, whatever, you know, something along that avenue, man, that would be like 700,000 views. And that same preacher would have a sermon called the Lordship or Jesus is Lord or something like that. It'd be like 5,000. And I, I'm thinking, okay, we got something a little off here, a little wrong. Without acknowledgement of his lordship, we can't change. Where the change in our life begins is understanding what his lordship is and what it means. We can't change ourselves by our own power, but the good news of Jesus includes the promise of his presence and his transforming power. What's impossible with man is possible with God. And you may be in a cycle this morning that you feel like it's impossible to break. And I'm going to tell you something. It, it, in, in human standards and definitions, it may be impossible. But nothing is impossible with God. Nothing is impossible with God. You can be healed in Jesus' name. You can be set free in Jesus' name. The pattern can stop today in the name of Jesus. He says he's delivered us out of the dominion of darkness 
and to the kingdom of his beloved son where we have redemption and the forgiveness of sin. He's brought us out of those old patterns and set us in a new way, in the new covenant. So, when Jesus becomes your Lord, you will have a different behavior. You'll have a different behavior. That's really my only main point this morning. If Jesus is the Lord of your life, you'll change. If Jesus is the Lord of your life, things will change. I remember it was years and years and years ago. I hadn't been in ministry, but probably just a little while. It was a season of just, man, just asking God to... To, to search me and to speak to me that I wanted some things, some patterns to change in my life. And, and I just remember, you know, I, I would take long times of just waiting before the Lord and, and just allowing him to speak to me. And I remember one time just, I was really in a season of prayer and it was after a, a night service, a Sunday night service. And, and pretty much, I mean, God was just contending with me in my heart and, and pretty much everybody left. I was the only one left in the building and and I was just before the Lord, and I, I, I remember getting up from that moment of just how I felt God dealing with me. And I told him, I said, God, I said, you sure are getting picky. <laughs> Listen, when, you, when the Lord is the Lord of your life, he'll be the Lord over everything. And I meant to, I, I, this, it just slipped my mind, I, I meant to have, I wanted to illustrate this, but... You know, in Acts, do you remember about Simon the sorcerer? I, I don't, so I think it was, if I remember right, I could be wrong. I should have even went, I didn't even go back and read the scripture, but I should have. But it's in Acts, and I, I believe it's in Ephesus. I could be wrong about the city, but I think it was Ephesus. And, and um, Philip goes, and I mean, like revival breaks out. Like people are getting saved and healed and, and God's really doing a work. And so um, I think Peter and John come and join him. And then they're seeing people get filled in the Holy Spirit. And there's this guy named Simon. And, he's, and the scripture talks about him and says how he, um, you know, he was a magician. He did things. He, he, give, he gave credit to God because of these tricks that he could do. You know, and so, but anyway, so he sees these people touched by the Spirit of God, speaking in tongues, prophesying, and, and whatever how the Holy Spirit was manifesting. And he's like, hey, guys, he's like, I want that. He's like, I will give you whatever, I'll pay you so I can have that. And so he really gets rebuked. He's like, oh, you guy, you're an idiot, you know. And many times I've thought about that verse that I think so many times what happens is, is we come to the Lord, and we know that we need change. We know that something has a, needs a shift in our life. And it doesn't matter where you are. In your, right now, you may be in this room, and, and you're not serving the Lord at all. You may be in this room, you've been serving the Lord for 50 years. The same concept is true. So many times we come to the Lord, and we're like, God, I need you to do a work in my life. I just, just whatever you want to do, I, I, you know, I need this, I need that. And, and the whole time we're doing that, we're, we're kind of holding the cards behind our back. And we're like, okay, God, I'll give you this. And I'll give you this one. But I'm, I'm gonna, I, gotta, I can't stop watching that show, Lord. I got to keep that one. I like that too much. I'm going to put it in my pocket right here. So you can be the Lord of all that, but not this. And when we do that, you know what happens? I'm, see, you can never grow. This is for free. You need to write it down. You can never grow beyond your last disobedience. You can never grow beyond your last disobedience. And that's why in America, we, I don't know if you know this, but in America, we like to have this spiritual epidemic that I don't, I don't know how they put an age on this. I'm not that smart. I don't get it. But Barna, he's a smart dude. And he says the average spiritual maturity age of those in America is three years. That people don't mature spiritually beyond three years of age. 
I mean, think, think about if, if that's the way our physical life was, is that if all we got to is three years old. Think, think, the, what would society be like? I mean, we got 50-year-olds that act like three-year-olds, but anyway. I'm sorry I said that out loud. It's going to get better, I promise. But when Jesus is our Lord, we no longer have to make excuses of our justification of a moral standard we want to live by because he becomes Lord of it all. Does that make sense? We don't have to keep justifying our old nature when he becomes and, and, and many times that prevents him from being the Lord of all. But I'm going to tell you through the work and the power of the Holy Spirit, you can have a shift in your life of him becoming the ruler in your life over all. You see, the, the reality is, is that change happens through our understanding of his lordship. Understanding the Lordship of Jesus, I mean, we, we begin to comprehend of really what it means to be forgiven and justified and sanctified and that work that he's done in our life. You know what? When you have a right view of the Lordship of Jesus, it'll change the way that you live. It'll change the way that you serve. It'll change the way that you give. It'll change the way that you worship. It'll change the atmosphere of your home. It'll change the atmosphere of your workplace. It will change everything. Because you are carrying with you a kingdom. <laughs> you are carrying with you a kingdom of whose Lord you're submitted to. And any time you walk into a room, you carry that authority with you. See, the reason why some of us are going to hell after a hell after a hell after a hell is that we haven't made the Lord the Lord of our life. And if you want to break the pattern and you want the kingdom of God to come with you and to move with you and to flow out of you, you've got to have a Lord and the Lord Jesus. And it changes everything. It changes everything. That was for free. I, don't, just, I have no idea where I'm in my notes. When a person yields to the lordship of Jesus, he or she, they acknowledge his ownership, and you give up all of your personal rights. And you say you yield it all to the Lordship of Jesus. Total, unreserved obedience. I remember when I was just really first getting a hold of this and this concept. You know, uh, it was years ago. I was a youth pastor. I was very zealous. I was very passionate for the Lord. And uh, I'm so passionate now. But, you know, sometimes zeal can have some unhealthy characteristics. I, I think that, but I, I'd, I'd rather deal with wildfire than no fire, but I, I was really zealous for the Lord, and I felt the Lord speak to me one time, and I know I've shared this before, but I really felt the Lord speak to me, because I, I love to read, I, I, um, I mean, no, no offense to Kalpha, but there's some of us that have read ODGs long before y'all were even born, <laughs> and so I was, I was reading a lot about Martin Luther, and uh, you know, here I'm just stepping into ministry, and I was reading about Martin Luther's life and all what he did, and and, and just a lot about him. And, and I read about how he prayed eight hours a day. He would, he would start praying at four in the morning and would pray till noon every day. And I was like, I've got to do that in my life. And so, man, I'm, I'm like, I'm going to pray eight hours a day. And, um, and I had this wise lady in our church. I went to, went to the house after one Sunday. And so we're just talking about things and kind of what God was doing in us. And I said, sister, I was like, I really think that let's like Martin Luther did. I'm going to pray eight hours a day. She said, wow. She said, what else are you going to do? I was like, well, what do you mean? And she said, don't you have to work? I'm like, yeah. You know, don't you have to do this? Yeah. Don't you have to? And I'm like, yeah, yeah. And she said, listen, I'm not telling you that that's not the Lord and not to do that. But, you know, sometimes you got to process, you know, that passion and zeal for the Lord. You know, what I'm trying to say is I... You know, the Lord, 
He wants to speak to us. He wants to lead us. He wants to guide us. But you don't have to like do this huge pendulum swing, you know. Is that, does that make sense? I mean, I, I'm, not, I'm not saying that for Jesus to be the Lord of your life, you've got to pray eight hours a day. Now, really, I mean, technically, if you look at the teaching of Scripture, you can pray more than eight hours a day because you pray without ceasing. And so she began to talk to me. She said, you know, instead of like going, because I mean, I had it in my mind. I was going to go lock myself in a closet and I was going to pray eight hours. And I began to think about it. I thought, I, you know, I, I don't know if you know this, but squirrel, you know, I mean, I, I kind of contend with some of that stuff sometimes. But listen, if he is Lord, if he is Lord, the Lord is my light. If he is Lord, the Lord is my song. If he is Lord, then the Lord is my banner. If he's Lord, then the, he's Lord my helper. If he's Lord, then he's Lord my righteousness. If he's Lord, then he's Lord my redeemer. If he's Lord, then he's Lord my strength. He's the Lord my rock. He's the Lord my fortress. He's the Lord my refuge. He's the Lord my deliverer. He's the Lord my high tower. He's the Lord my shield. He's the Lord my shepherd. And so many times what prevents us from saying, okay, God, here it is, because there's so much we want to keep back here. But if you'll just give it all to him, then you'll really understand understand who the Lord is. You'll understand his power. You'll understand his love for you. But you can't hold anything back. You can't have him Lord over some areas of your life. He has to be Lord over all. You don't pick and choose what he'll be Lord over. He has to be Lord over all. You can't have him Lord over all of your needs, but not be Lord over your money. You can't have him lord over your weakness and not need him when you're feeling strong. You can't have him lord over your business and him not lord over your relationships. You can't have him lord over the gray days and not lord over the sunny days. You can't have him lord over the hurt and not surrender every relationship to the Lord. He's got to be lord over it all. I mean, how many times have you prayed? I, I know I prayed a few times. God, if you just get me out of this one. If you just get me out of this one. I remember I was hunting one time. We're in La Mesa and we're looking at transition. And I said, God, if you want me to resign my church, then just have the biggest buck that ever walked out, walk out right now. You know, I, I, did, I prayed it. I was a pastor and I prayed it. I did. And a big old buck came out. I'm not saying I resign, but that wasn't here, okay? If you'll just do something in my marriage this time, if you'll just get me out of this bind this time, listen, if he has to be Lord of it all. But Jesus is saying, if you'll surrender, I got you. If you'll submit it all, I got you. If you don't call me Lord, if you just don't call me Lord, but you completely surrender to his lordship, I mean, he's saying, I have you. And I'm going to tell you, when he becomes a Lord of your life, the patterns in your life can change. They can break. And yes, sometimes it's scary, and sometimes, you know, I mean, we, we kind of get concerned what he's going to ask us before he ever asks us, and I think that keeps us a little hesitant sometimes, but I have never regretted being all in. Never. Never regretted. Never regretted. Do you want the patterns in your life to change? Do you want to be set free from addiction? Do you want your marriage healed? Do you want a shift in your finances? Do you want something to change at work? Do you want something to change at home? Do you, do, you, do you need a shift in your life? Then really come to the place of the Lord and say, God, here I am. And then not be something of lip service. And say, I'm, just, I'm, I'm giving the Lord of all everything. 
everything. I ask you to stand this morning. Thanks for tuning in to the Odessa First Assembly podcast. If you've enjoyed today's message, be sure to subscribe to our podcast on your favorite platform so you never miss an episode. You can also follow us on social media for updates and inspirational content throughout the week. Find us on Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, and YouTube at Odessa First AG. And if you're in the area, we'd love to have you join us in person for our Sunday morning services at 1030 a.m. You can also catch our live stream on Facebook, YouTube, and Church Online. Thanks again for listening. We'll see you next time on the Odessa First Assembly podcast.